What I find interesting is uh, this topic, the psychology of a hero. Wow, that's, that's not an easy topic to talk about. It's uh, pretty much a challenge. And I have an idea that there is no shortage of strong opinion amongst people in this room about what it takes to be a hero. You all have probably some example in your life of somebody who has been a hero. Uh, and it's interesting because when you get people into a room and you talk about heroes, uh, and there is definitely a very strong reactions to what it takes to be one. Uh, so where do I begin? Um, it's a tough topic, and so where I thought I'd begin is I thought I would look at my experiences with young men who come into the Air Force to be something significant. They come into the Air Force to be something remarkable, and watching them from day one go all the way through training and into the operational field to do things that are quite remarkable, to demonstrate acts of courage that I think all of us would consider quite extraordinary. But with that being said, not everybody makes it. And so what I'm gonna do is I'll share with you the research and my observations that I've conducted over the last, I'd say, 10 years. And hopefully you'll have something meaningful to take home with you. Now the folks that I'm talking about are battlefield airmen. They are the, some of the most elite special duty operators in the military. They are quite remarkable. Now when I think about the lab, a lot of times with Battlefield Airmen, what we think about is the technology. The technology that we put on them so they can efficiently and effectively carry out their duties. And yes, technology certainly helps us win wars. But at the center of it all is the airmen. See, regardless of the technology that we equip somebody with, it's the character traits of that airman and how well they can adapt to adversity and of course the unpredictability. And so what I want to do is talk to you a little bit about those particular traits. First of all, many try out, many compete. What you may not know is that most of these individuals that try out for battlefield airmen or special operation duty positions look like they stepped out of GQ magazine. They clearly are chiseled, they're buff, and they are extremely fit. They represent some of America's fittest individuals. What you may not, also not know is that uh, they're very smart. Even though most of them are, call are uh, high school graduates, most of them have IQs of about 120. That's in the 90th percentile. That means they're just as smart as physicians, surgeons, and lab scientists in AFRL. Uh, <laughs> so there's a lot of brawn and there's a lot of brain behind these individuals that go out and compete. Unfortunately, not everybody makes it. And in many situations, we have a 90% attrition rate. So imagine this, we're already working with the, great, the, the brightest and the strongest young adults in America, and yet we have a 90% attrition rate. And what does that mean? Well, it means a lot of things. Perhaps we're not necessarily recruiting well, or perhaps it's the demands. Yes, the demands are great. And because these individuals are as elite as they are already when they come into the Air Force, they're not short on trophies. Typically in their background, their walls are lined with trophies. So in terms of dealing with adversity, this isn't something new for them. But the demands that we throw at them are things that they've never experienced before. And I'll share with you what some of those things are and what separates those who fail from those who succeed. The other piece of this is that the costs are very high. See, we're expanding in special operations. Yes, we're about air superiority and developing aircraft and putting men in those aircraft and women in those aircraft. But the other piece of this is we're expanding in special operations at a rapid rate. Now, what you, I think, might find interesting is that the Air Force spent close to $40 million over a five-year period to recruit close to 2,000 of America's finest, strongest, and brightest candidates. And out of that, we only got about 200. That's a lot of money. Now, if we were to fast forward things five years from now, we have to be able to do things more effectively, cost efficient, and expeditiously. Otherwise, we're not gonna be able to keep up the demand and meet our mission requirements. So with that being said, what makes a hero? And that's where we started to get engaged in our research to figure that out. They're already bright, they're already strong. So there's got to be something else to it. So what we did was we merged a lot of psychological testing, a lot of evaluations, a lot of observations both in the field and in training, and we came up with what we would consider a pattern of behavior that is predictive of success. Now I'm not going to share with you all of those traits, but I have cherry-picked a handful, and I'll tell you at the end why I've cherry-picked these traits. 
The first one is passion. Everybody in this room is going to think, oh, yeah, that's obvious. It's the desire to succeed. Well, everybody who comes out for special operations has a desire to succeed. Well, interestingly enough, about those who succeed, it's a bit more. It's about purpose. It's about meaning. It's about drive to be something significant. That's what delineates those who just simply want to achieve from those who really do succeed. Now, here's an example of this. So, we, as you know, we push pararescue men to the point of exhaustion. We have a number of physical activities where we push them so hard that they feel like they've got nothing left to give. You take that candidate out who says, I've got nothing more. I am done. I cannot do a single sit-up. You take a heavy block, you put it on his uh, chest, and you say, okay, read those words. And I'm sure all of you could read those words. Those words say that others may live. That's their motto. Those individuals that have internalized that sense of purpose well beyond something where they look for a recognition or a trophy, but they have internalized it to say, this is why I am here, man, they bang out 10, 15, 20 more sit-ups. They reach inside and they are able to achieve something they thought was impossible when they have a sense of purpose behind that passion. The other piece to this is assertiveness. Okay, so everybody might say, that's obvious. It's your capability to speak up in a group, speak for oneself. Well, yeah, that's right. But the assertiveness here that we're talking about goes a little bit deeper. It's not your Webster Dictionary version of assertiveness. The assertiveness here actually has two specific qualities to it. The first one being, hey, I recognize and need feedback. So it's the assertiveness of being straightforward and transparent with one's capabilities. That, not, that means not overstating what you have or what your traits are, but simply being honest, being straightforward with yourself as well as straightforward with others. And the other piece that we found that delineated those who succeed were those training candidates that raised their hand and said, yes, I need help. I can't do this on my own. I need help. I am willing to recognize my weaknesses. Yes, I adopt my strengths, but I know that in order to succeed, I have to overcome my weaknesses and I seek feedback. Now, what's interesting behind that is that assertiveness is very much linked to humility. I didn't combine those two initially, but then when we started looking at the testing and the observations, we realized that they were a bit related. Okay, so a lot of people assume that in order to be special operations, you're not short on pride, and that's true. Um, but there's also a strong sense of humility behind this. And what I mean by that is, you peel back the layers and what you find are individuals who do two things. One, they say, my accomplishments are not the single effects of one individual, but a team. And you look at those who succeed, especially in the training environment, and every time you ask them, you say, hey, what was it that got you through? They'll cite a number of people that were in their class or who helped them along the way. That's a big deal. And the other piece to this is being team-oriented, recognizing consistently that in order to achieve the remarkable or the impossible, you can't do it alone. So here's an example. So yes, we like to exhaust people with a variety of different exercises. We'll put a log in front of them and say, your mission is to hold this thing up as long as you possibly can. Now, if you're not short on humility, the thing that you're going to want to do is show everybody around you just how strong you are. You're going to want to hold that log by yourself. And you, if you are short on humility, will watch your teammates drop off. And when that happens, the log comes down on you and it crushes everybody. However, if you have humility and recognize this isn't about being able to prove how strong I am, but how well I operate in a team, you realize that actually when you start communicating, the people on the ends can hold it up while the people in the middle rest and they switch back and forth. Any single candidate can hold this thing up for a brief moment of time before everybody's crushed. But when you operate as a team, you can hold this thing up all day long. Whether you're in the mud, water, people screaming at you, spraying water in your face and other things, you're going to do it. And it's pretty remarkable. So humility is a clear um, trait that's required in order to succeed. How about resourcefulness? I think that's something that we're educated all the time about. Do what you got with what you have with the limited resources you've been given. But this is a lot deeper. The resourcefulness of those who succeed versus fail is a mindset. It's a, it's a mindset of what is called thankfulness. And I'll, I'll give you an example about what I mean. 
Those who succeed look at what they have and they go, yes, this is what I have, but I am so thankful that I have it. Whereas those who fail are the ones that look at it and they complain about what they don't have or perhaps the limitations of what they do have. So let me give you an example. We take a group of candidates and we push them and we put them to a 16 foot wall. In front of them, there are two cinder blocks, a two by four that's about four feet long and a four foot rope. And you say, your instructions are, you've got to get past that wall. Now the people who succeed look at that and they say, that is awesome, look what I have. If I stack this just the right way, instead of having to get over a 16 foot wall, perhaps I'm just having to get over an eight foot wall. Whereas those who fail, yeah, they're smart, they're really bright, but they'll look at that and they'll spend an inordinate amount of time complaining, going, is this a mind game? Are they trying to trick us here? Whereas those who succeed are already moving forward. Sometimes you get uh, a really bright one who tries to make the human slingshot with what they've got there. <laughs> or in other cases, you get the really bright one who notices the crowbar that's 10 feet away, in, uh, buried by some leaves. Walks over, grabs the crowbar, looks at the uh, culvert in the pipe that runs underneath the, the uh, wall, pulls off the grate, and says to his buddies, if we want to get past that wall, let's just go underneath it. So resourcefulness, creativity, and a sense of thankfulness for what one has and not what one doesn't have is absolutely essential to success. Okay, how about this one? Impulse and fear control. A lot of people assume that the hero has no fear, right? You're gonna go into battle, you're gonna have bullets flying at you, and therefore, in order to succeed and think rational, rationally, you have no fear. Well, that's actually not true. When we do the subjective ratings on those who fail, as, as well as those who pass, the subjective ratings of fear are the same. They are both afraid. But it's not necessarily the absence of fear, it's how well you can control that fear versus fear controlling you. See, when we're put underneath adversity and exhaustion and limited resources and what we think is impossible, fear and anxiety can set in, and that's okay. It's just a matter of how well you can control that. So let me give you an example of fear control. Here's an exercise that we put PJs through that would kill many of the people in this room. I'll take your hands, cuff it behind your back, and then I'll cuff your ankles, and I'll push you into an eight to 10 foot pool of water. Now, interestingly enough, the strategies of survival are quite simple. Allow yourself to go all the way down to the bottom, do a dolphin kick up, your head's gonna break the surface for about one to two seconds, take a breath, and repeat as you go down. Do that for several minutes, an extended period of time. That's fear control, that's impulse control. In order to think rationally, objectively, in life-saving circumstances, you have to be able to control that. Now, if you look at the lower bottom of the screen, you might see something quite remarkable. There's an individual who is laying on his side at the bottom of the pool. He lost his uh, mask, now he's picking the mask up with his teeth, when he surfaces, he'll fling it to the side and repeat. It's quite remarkable. Fear control. Optimism, that's the next one. I think everybody's got their own definition of optimism, but no, it's not necessarily the typical power of positive thinking. Um, yes, positive thinking is absolutely essential, but what makes the difference between success and failure is a sense of perspective. See, every one of these training candidates, as well as even in an operational setting, will experience failure. They will experience defeat. But optimism is maintaining perspective. That is, what can I learn from this? What can I do in order to grow from the failure and the defeat that I've experienced? And from that, one realizes, wow, I learn more from failure at times than I do success. So it's maintaining that perspective. Okay, so the next one is tenacity. Now let me just remind you again that this is a remarkable group of young adults that come out for this. They are some of America's most elite and smartest candidates that we have to offer. And so when you look at their potential, when you see them get off the bus, every one of them has the potential to succeed. But sometimes the only thing that determines the difference between those who succeed versus those who fail is simply tenacity. The individual that you're looking at is not the smartest, 
nor physically capable individual in this group. But for some reason, he's further ahead than everybody else. And it's the desire to finish. Regardless of the obstacles, regardless of the issues or problems that one is faced with, one says, I will not give up, I will finish. So a key, key trait. Now let me finish up with this self-sacrifice, uh, this last one. A lot of people th assume, yes, I know what that's about, and that's part of one of our core values, service before self. Yes, absolutely, and it's essential. But when you peel back the layers and you look at and you ask those individuals who succeeded, what defines them for self-sacrifice? They'll tell you a few things. And it really boils down to a simple phrase, and that is, regardless, it is more important in terms of what one does with one's life and how one lives one's life and the mark that they make versus how long one lives. So that's one of these perspectives that gets back to a sense of purpose, trying to be remarkable and significant. We see this borne out in the battlefield all the time with those individuals who are willing to run toward a fight rather than away from a fight in order so that others may live. Okay, so that brings us to why we're here today, right? Develop technology and capabilities that allow us to extend our warfighting abilities and achieve our warfighting missions. When I think about these traits that I just discussed today, many of them, as you know, can logically be perceived as those sort of things that you would see for success in the lab. They would. All those sort of traits, as you reflect upon them, are those same sort of things that we can rely upon as we face our own challenges. How many of us has heard there's not enough money, there's not enough manpower, there's limited resources, I have to work on multiple teams and adapt with, to multiple different people? So a lot of these traits that I've discovered, that we've learned about, that are successful on the battlefield are oftentimes those same sort of traits that get translated into the lab. So that gets a little bit to my story. So before joining the lab, I served as an active duty psychologist for several years. And part of my role was attached with and being um, servicing battlefield airmen communities. I had really two jobs. One is to evaluate them to determine how ready they were for training. And the other piece was to help them recover from injury and wounds from the battlefield. And what I realized with the tools that I was given is we were limited. They were not very precise, and it really relied upon subjective judgment, the experience of the individual with this community. And I thought we could do better. There's a way that we can do this way better, more effectively. So what we did when I joined the lab Fortunately, as part of a team, uh, their mission was how can we actually more precisely line up psychological traits that are predictive of performance? How can we actually do a better job with evaluating not only the fidelity of an individual's psychological capacity, but how well we can link it up specifically to performance and specific missions? Well, we've done that. Today, we're standing here with the ability now, with a high level of precision, to evaluate a person's psychological disposition across a wide range of traits and look at that individual with a solid level of empirical validity and go, we know how ready you are. And this is what we can focus in on to help you become even more ready, to achieve even higher state of performance. And that's not a short feat, especially when we're already working with some of America's strongest and most fit individuals. Now, the cool thing about this also is that uh, we've developed the capability to do this anytime, anywhere, worldwide. That's right. So all of you have cell phones in this uh, audience, and I think that's pretty cool. It doesn't matter if you're in the remote regions of Africa or any other part of the world, or whether you are part of the reserve or guard and you just got off a mission and you're now sitting in your front room. I can psychologically, we as the Air Force, can psychologically evaluate you and get a readiness rating and figure out where we need to improve your performance, where we can focus in on helping you recover. And it's interesting because just last week, we evaluated every single combat rescue officer across the world. That has never been done before. More importantly, we actually crunched those results within that week, developed a statistical formula, and today, you may not know, but we're selecting the next generation of combat rescue officers. And we're using the data gathered from what we did last week to inform the decisions and how we make the assessment process today. And I think that's pretty cool. And that's not the singular accomplishments of one individual, but a team. Now, what's interesting about this is that I have to maintain perspective. 
because this accomplishment, when you think about it, is only one of a long list of accomplishments from AFRL. AFRL has a numerous list of amazing insights, discoveries, and improvements in technology that allow us to step back and go, wow, we did this? This is amazing. See, following me, you're gonna hear from a handful of speakers who are gonna actually express to you some pretty cool things that we've done recently. Now, as you listen to them, my only request is that you think about the traits that uh, you heard about today. Because when you reflect upon those traits as you're listening to them, you're gonna realize that all of them have to some degree and varying degrees expressed each of those traits to achieve the level of success that they're gonna to talk to you today about. So, thank you.